Today we're going to do some meditation and discussion on um, the Buddhist idea of the three compassions. It's kind of three ways to get your mind into a compassionate headspace. Um, you know, three very simple things to remember um, in order to keep the heart open. So, um, so that's what we'll do today. And we'll just go ahead and start with um, a breathing meditation just to reconnect and to settle. So if you want to get a nice posture, straight and stable. And think to yourself, I'm doing this process in order to develop my mind, to open the heart, so I can be of greatest benefit to both myself and others. And then shift your focus to the breath. And as you watch your breath, make gentle adjustments to your focus, just gradually making it sharper and clearer and more attentive, giving your full interest to the breath, gradually letting go of what came before, what will come after, gently disengaging from outside sounds, trying not to be captivated by your own thoughts. Just watch the breath primarily. Let everything else be in the background and not bother you. See if you can allow your mind to settle into a space that is neither too tightly focused nor too loosely focused. 
a combination of relaxation and clarity with just one simple object, the breath. Your attention is riding the breath out, riding the breath in. Allow your mind to relax into that simplicity. and then gently relaxing your attention. Nice to see you all. Um, so it might be um, a good opportunity to talk about things that will help your heart open when you don't feel like it. Um, ways to not lose your groundedness and not to lose your stability and not to lose your intention um, when things become more busy. Um, and so, you know, the relationship between the heart and the head in Buddhism is a, sort of a different conversation because mind and heart are the same word. So um, citta, um, you know, this word for heart and mind in Buddhism, it's, it's something that we're always exploring how to use logic to connect to um, an emotional response or how to use intelligence to awaken an experiential thing. And it seems odd, you know, it can seem uh, forced or fabricated. It could seem artificial and ingenuine. And so we don't want to use logic to get ourselves into something like compassion because it seems false in some way, um, you know, like we've manufactured something. When in fact, what we're doing is using intelligence and logic to remind ourselves of what we already know. Yeah, and when you go back over the wisdom you've already touched, then your, you know, kind of heart response comes into an alignment. Yeah, and you can kind of wake back up 
that openness and that clarity and that connection by accessing kind of the more um, dry aspects of the mind, you know, the intelligence or the logic. It actually, they can collaborate beautifully and they do collaborate beautifully. And you're the one that knows whether it's become artificial or not. So if you have enough self-awareness, you fall out of that trap, you know, of going somewhere artificial, you know if you're artificial or not. So these processes are to really sit with when you don't have compassion, but you would like to have compassion for someone, what gets you there? You know, to just kind of sit with it. You know, there's days when it just comes so naturally and the flow is so beautiful and whoever is in front of you, you're just wishing them well, you're wishing them nothing but the best. And it's just coming, you know, as if naturally. And then some days you want to be that way and that's how you identify yourself. You know, you identify yourself as a compassionate, open-hearted person, but then it's not coming, you know? And you think, oh no, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with them? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with them? You know, whatever is happening. And so how do you work yourself into a genuinely compassionate state if you're not there already? And so if you just sit with, in the past, what has worked? Just letting it go and letting it arise naturally, not putting pressure on yourself. Is it having a stern conversation with yourself or a humorous conversation with yourself? In the past when you've wanted to be compassionate but weren't right away, what got you there? Just kind of sit with that for a minute. What gets you there? Is it picturing the person a certain way when they were more vulnerable? or picturing the other person when they have been more beneficial, you know, kind of framing some snapshot in time of their past when they were more relatable for you. You know, just kind of sit with that. Does anyone have immediate thoughts that come to mind about um, what helps you come into a compassionate space when it didn't start that way right off the bat? ways that you picture them or ways that you kind of move into that space. It's so difficult, isn't it? If you want to be compassionate, but it's not coming. Yeah. Um, and the tendency for then self hatred or self loathing or self disappointment is huge if it's not just coming. And so I think that rather than beat yourself up about not being compassionate all the time, you just take a step back from it and look at compassion as a tool and a skill. It's a tool and a skill that we already have, that we were born with, that was nurtured in us. And it's something that needs to be developed and actively cultivated like a garden. So, you know, having compassion, we already have compassion, but if we want more compassion more often, we need to stop and think about what are the causes for it. Yeah. So in Buddhism, we talk about kind of three ways to get your heart to open or the three compassions. And the three compassions mean that you're kind of looking at sentient beings or people in general, um, you're looking at a specific aspect of their experience to try and trigger an open heart. So the first type of compassion is the obvious type that we always talk about, which is seeing their suffering and wishing them to be free of that suffering. You know, just basic everyday compassion, basic spiritual compassion, which itself is incredibly significant and powerful, but sometimes seeing the suffering of another person doesn't trigger compassion for us. It can trigger annoyance. We can say, why are you suffering that way? You don't have to suffer that way. If you just did this and this, you wouldn't suffer. Stop it. You know, it can actually, if we're in a bad space, it can trigger impatience and irritation when we see someone suffering. There you go again, doing that same thing that you've been doing for years. Yeah, stop hurting yourself. You're driving us all crazy. Yeah, this can happen, right? It doesn't always happen. Often seeing suffering immediately opens the heart and that's usually our gateway to compassion is seeing, wow, they're really struggling physically, they're struggling mentally, they're struggling, struggling emotionally, financially, in their relationships, whatever it is, you see their struggle and you wish them well and it just happens, no problem. So when it doesn't, 
you can say, all right, so today's suffering is not the gateway. <laughs> Seeing suffering is not the gateway to compassion today. What's the gateway? Another one that you can use is um, what's called compassion based on seeing impermanence. All right, so this is interesting, the relationship between compassion and impermanence, the, the fact that things change. Normally we talk about impermanence on its own. In this context, you're really seeing that, all right, people suffer because they forget impermanence. Do you agree? People suffer because they forget that things change. When they remember that things change, they live in flow. They live with less resistance. When they forget it, then they lock down and they try to create stability of a type that is not possible. Yeah. Right? When we forget that things change all the time, good, bad, neutral, but constant, when we forget that, we suffer. When other people forget that, they suffer. So if someone is in front of you and you want to generate compassion towards them to think about how is their behavior now showing that they've forgotten impermanence? Maybe they've even forgotten the most obvious form of impermanence, which is death, right? If they've forgotten death, their very tiny home today with not getting their favorite parking spot feels like a really big deal. If they knew they were going to die, if they remembered that they were gonna die, maybe in 20 or 30 years, but if they were remembering death, does it matter that you didn't get your favorite parking spot? If you knew you were dying this week, do you care about that kind of nonsense? You just genuinely don't. You don't have to force it, right? So, you know, so remembering impermanence helps you live in flow. So if someone is not living in flow, you know that they've forgotten that. And it, so it can help you open your heart. Just kind of look at someone with bad behavior, with annoying behavior, with suffering behavior, and ask yourself, is some of that driven by them forgetting the fact of change? Yeah. And it can create this pathway of empathy and affinity because you know that you do the same thing. You know, you know all the times you've got caught up in petty or superficial problems and, you know, things that won't matter a year from now. You know, we know how we do that to ourselves and we ruin our own peace by forgetting change. So when you see someone else do it, you just go, oh, yeah, I do that. Yep, I get it. And you just, the heart falls open. Does that one make sense how to, how to use the fact of impermanence to generate compassion? It's kind of a new relationship to talk about, the, those two topics coming together. Yeah. So it's, it's relatively straightforward, right? It's not some sort of groundbreaking new idea, but it's, it's a conscious remembering of it when just seeing suffering isn't enough to get you there. Yeah. Then the third kind of compassion is um, kind of a more subtle philosophical compassion, which is realizing that people suffer because they don't realize the way that they exist. People suffer because they don't realize the nature of identity and self. They project something false and then identify with that. And that projecting process is the root of the problem for me, for them, for today, for always, the root of the issue has been a misunderstanding of the way the self exists in relation to others or in relation at all. So it's a, it's a deeper philosophical point because you ask, who is this in front of me exactly? Who is this suffering person in front of me? Yeah, and you think, are they their current moment of suffering? Are they their history that brought them here? Are they their, I don't know, gender and personality and culture and race and whatever and whatever? Are they those things? They have those things. They're labeled on the basis of those things, but that is not them. But if any point they think of that as them, they're creating a point of friction with themselves and the rest of the world. They're creating an otherness potential. Yeah. So you could say, you know, I am a female person, no problem, merely labeled female person on, you know, a series of thoughts, ideas, genetics, history, 
just cause whatever I, that happens to be a mere label. But as soon as I think that is me, that is me. And if you call me something else, and if you mislabel me, then I am taking a wound to the core of my soul, right? That's a problem, isn't it? And yet we do that all the time. If someone thinks that you are less educated than you are, or less intelligent than you are, or older than you are, or younger than you are, or something other than how you see yourself, there's a point of friction and otherness that arises that makes you suffer. But if you think, all right, in a certain context, I am this. In a certain context, I am that. In a certain context, you know, you are mother. In a certain context, you are daughter. You know, in a certain context, you are old. In a certain context, you are young. It's related to who else is around and the way they label things. And so to, to be offended by being mislabeled is human and natural. And we want to try not to do that to others. But when they do it to us, it's a very good point of exploration of asking, right, who is there anyway? It's only in context that I exist as I seem to exist. It's only related to context. There's no little core there. And when you live in that knowledge, there is not so much us and them. There is not this othering, which means you don't feel alienated. You don't feel alone. You don't feel like the only one of something in a group of people. You feel connected to your human community. And when you feel connected, you're happy. That's something that we know so much from your work, from my work. We know that when you feel connected, you are happy, right? And so the way to feel connected is to stop feeling so much me. <laughs> me feels more alone, the more solid me is. <laughs> the less solid me is, the more kind of, um, ambiguous and changeable and merely labeled that you can think of the me, the happier the me is. So that's, that's an interesting idea to explore. So if the person in front of you is really struggling, you can ask yourself, is there a point of their identity that they're holding on so tightly that it's making them alienated from others? Yeah, and you know that you do that and it hurts you, you can see them doing it, and it hurts them, and your heart opens. And it doesn't mean that you necessarily challenge anything about how they see themselves, because lots of people don't have mental space for that conversation. Lots of people have no interest in that conversation. Um, but it's an inner conversation you have with yourself to get the heart to open back up. And then what you might actually say is, hey, let's go for coffee. You know, what you actually say, you know, has to be specific to the relationship, you know, and what you know of them and where their receptivity is. But understanding the role of hard wiring, you know, overly branding what you think of as you is a cause for a lot of everyday suffering and long-term suffering, knowing that with self-knowledge Seeing that in others opens your heart of compassion. Does that one make sense or is that one a bit too far out? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you can, you can open the heart by seeing suffering. You can open the heart by remembering that impermanence is a fact, but forgetting it makes you suffer. Yes, and you can open the heart by remembering that the self doesn't inherently exist because it dependently arises. Not knowing that makes us suffer. Yeah, so suffering and not knowing why makes us suffer more. Yeah, being impermanent but forgetting that makes us suffer more. Lacking inherent existence but assuming the opposite makes us suffer. So if you're, if you're kind of looking at the way people um, destroy their own peace and the way we destroy our own peace, then even someone very, very badly behaved or someone very stuck in their suffering and identified with their suffering in their victimhood, we don't have so much judgmentalness. We have just an immediate kind of affinity that opens up between us. Yeah. So those three types of compassion, um, you know, I find it really, really useful. Most of the time, just remembering that someone is suffering is enough, isn't it? Just remembering that they're suffering and that's why they're behaving this way. 
it's enough, but there are times when that is not enough. Yeah, or it's um, that particular relationship has kind of gotten burnt out by how much of their suffering you've seen and how repetitive it is and how many times you've gone over the same story. You know, if it's someone that you've kind of talked about a similar suffering again and again, you maybe even have come to conclusions about how to solve it. They've come to conclusions how to solve it. And then they just never do that. You know, a certain kind of impatience can creep up and we think, all right, remember last time we talked about this, you were gonna stop doing that and it was gonna make your life easier? Do that. <laughs> you know, you can get that kind of impatience. Um, and so when that happens, think they've forgotten the fact of change. They've forgotten their identity is not as solid as they're holding it to be. They've forgotten those two things and that's really poignant and that's, a powerful knowledge to have about life. Yeah, because now I'm not going to be so harsh with them because I do it too all the time. All the time. Yeah. So, yeah, thoughts about that? Questions about those three? Um, is there, I mean, it's, but these three kinds of compassion, in terms of like having compassion for the self, are these kind of ones that you sort of, people tend to employ or is it because it's a bit easier to step into compassion for yourself by thinking of your younger self or past self or it's a bit easier to have that kind of empathy for self? is this sort of compassion, the three kinds, but better for others and our sort of external relationships, especially those outside our sort of family or friends? The, yeah, they can be used for both um, self-compassion and others' compassion. And it's kind of like you need to do a little bit of self-compassion using these three in order for it to work for others. You know, you need to see how forgetting impermanence makes you suffer, how forgetting the ephemeral amorphous nature of the identity makes you suffer you need to kind of see that within yourself and generate a real strong may i be well may i be happy may i be free of the traps of those habits may i remember my wisdom and in that way not struggle so much in life and just be with that and then you know if you've been with that genuinely it's much easier to then have that come out in relation to others because you're really seeing yourself in them, even if the details are different. Yeah. So it goes both ways. Yeah, and it should go both ways. You know, any, any teaching of, of Buddhism about how to think of others is something to think of self. It's just, you know, when we say all sentient beings, all sentient beings, you're not excluded from all sentient beings. It's not like all sentient beings except me. You know, <laughs> you're included. It's just kind of putting the self in the correct perspective. Of all sentient beings, you're a very small percentage, but you're important, just like all of them are important. But not quite as important as your ego thinks. And the more important your ego thinks you are, the more you suffer, right? <laughs> the more kind of like self-importance you get, the more fragile we become. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite interesting, this one. Yeah, other thoughts before we do a meditation on it or like a points of to clarify yeah oh. so what you said which is very very uh, i really am touched by this and i know it's something that can help me and i think uh, about raising kids uh, is it a wisdom that comes to life in a more uh, older uh, time? Or can we teach our children uh, to, to look at these things and to, be, to, to raise something in, in, inside themselves, uh, thinking about all these three uh, wisely uh, roots that, can, they, that they can suffer less yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, you know, all of your kids are so lucky to, lucky to have you as parents because you're already even considering that it might be something to model. You know, it's amazing. And, um, you know, I'm not a parent, but I, I used to have a kid's 
group that I would meet at the Dharma Center. It was one of my favorite things. And the kids were from like three years old up until 13 years old. And the way that I would try to convey these ideas was much much less teaching them like I, like we're talking now and much more about kind of inviting that wisdom out of them. So I, you know, just say a lot of remember the time, remember the time when, remember the time when to help them understand impermanence. So I'm not like, all right, children, let's talk about impermanence. It was more like showing them that they know about impermanence by asking them the right kind of questions. Um, and similarly, um, with, with things like identity with kids, there's a certain security they find in having some sort of identity and they kind of need to when they're little, sort of, but if they get too rock solid about it, then they, um, you know, limit possibilities, don't they? Right? Say they, they think I'm going to be a famous tennis star and that's who I am and who I will be. And then they hurt their knee. They don't have other possibilities available to them because their whole childhood was, I'm going to be a famous tennis star, right? So with kids, I think that just exploring how flexible identity can be and how much more fun life is when it's flexible. You know, like today you were Superman, tomorrow you're Wonder Woman, the next day you'll be a bear, you know, when they're little, little. It's like when you play make-believe, you can play, just play. And that play shows you how you know, abstract identity really is. And you can land on all sorts of identity lightly and it function really beautifully. But as soon as you make it too concrete, you create an otherness and an alienation. So to somehow encourage that flexibility of mind, you know? So you guys are much, you are experts of parenting and child psychology. All I know is how to play with kids with Dharma ideas. <laughs> so that's, that's all I've got to offer there. Dharma play. Yeah. Dharma play. But it seems to help, you know, the kids I've known for a long time, they do seem to genuinely have taken to heart these ideas and you hear them come out with this amazing wisdom and you think, gee, I wish I knew that when I was their age, <laughs> life would be a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, other other thoughts, questions? Like everything on one level, it's so simple. And on another level, it's so difficult. Like everything, right? Um, but I think that we can take a lot of strength from remembering that bringing up your own wisdom on purpose to the forefront of your mind makes you not forget it as often. You know, thinking that you need to just rely on your wisdom without pulling it forward kind of can do yourself a disservice, you know, because you're like waiting for all your good qualities that you know that you have, you're waiting for them to kick in, even though you're not kind of like bringing them up and dusting them off and looking at them again and then putting them back in the bag. You know, they, we just carry around our bag of tools and, and forget to like lay them all out and examine them again and kind of get them fresh. So, um, so anyway, that's what we're doing these days. All right, so would you like to do the meditation? It'll just be a simple analysis, a very gentle one. And we'll start again with just a couple minutes of mindfulness to let the mind settle. So come back to your body. Hopefully you haven't left the body, but if you have, come back to it. And just allow any tension that might have accumulated to release. So just check in with the areas of the body that normally hold tension and bring a self-compassion to those areas, soothing them with your thoughts. And your face relaxes into its natural position. Your shoulders drop down into their natural position.
and all the way down and through tension releasing. And think, may we develop compassion that is unending, that is expansive for both oneself and others exponentially. Back to the breath. And now choose someone who you don't have as much compassion for as you would like. Someone where compassion isn't flowing freely towards them. Whether it's a patient or a colleague or a family member or even a political figure. Someone where you notice that your heart is blocked. Just take a minute and picture someone like that in front of you. And as you think of this person where your heart is blocked, just take a minute and project, assume, imagine what some of their sufferings might be. Whether that's actually the case or not, just using your own human experience, what might be going on for this person in terms of suffering? not needing to force compassion, more of a just objective list. List what is suffering for them. And think about the ways that their suffering rises up their defenses, 
and their negative behaviors, the way their suffering might stifle their progress and their transformation because of their past relationship with suffering and their past relationship with not knowing how to apply tools to relieve it. And then just sort of leave that analysis in front of you and come back to yourself and ask, are there ever times I suffer even when I know better, when I know how I got myself into it, when I know how to get myself out of it? And despite that knowledge, still I've made myself suffer through unskillful choices. Do I ever do that? suffer needlessly. And just see if that self-knowledge of knowing that sometimes you suffer needlessly, see if that allows you to soften towards this other person. What they do to themselves, I do to myself. It is only the details that are different. And see if you can allow that affinity and empathy to grow into a compassion that says, may you be free of your suffering. May I be free of my suffering. May we be free of our suffering. Holding the knowledge of suffering together with the knowledge of potential for freedom. Their suffering is not who they are. It is not who I am. And then using the same person Shift to thinking about perhaps their short-sightedness, the way in which they forget impermanence, the way they forget that things change, and the way that forgetfulness reinforces or leads to so many of their daily struggles, so many of their hardships, Maybe they think too much of just today and don't plan well for the future. Or maybe they become obsessed with the future and try to over plan, even though all the details are not certain.
maybe forgetting impermanence makes this person have too much emphasis on the little daily dramas, on the small superficial worries, on inconveniences. These things come to dominate their day and their life because of forgetting the broader context and how little these things will matter in even a year from now. Forgetting impermanence makes us lose perspective and suffer because of it. And so allow the mind to move back and forth between what you do when you forget change and what they might be doing when they forget change. And just scan back and forth, building a pathway of empathy and relation. even if your projections and assumptions are not exactly the case for them, just allow your knowledge of humanity to make some educated assumptions. And so let the poignancy and the sweetness of their short-sightedness somehow touch you by remembering how easy it is for you individually to forget the way things change, to block or stifle the flow of life, like trying to hold on to water as it flows. How when we do that, life is so much more of a struggle. When they do that, life is so much more of a struggle. And think to this person, may you remember change and impermanence in order to release yourself from the pain that comes from grasping at permanence, of trying to force a stability that just isn't there. And may I do the same. And then finally think about the way in which holding on to a solid identity 
creates more suffering for this person. How many times that they feel threatened or disrespected or misunderstood because of how tightly they hold to their identity. How they hold themselves up with it, not seeing that it's a prison of their own creation. When they feel supported and their, their identity is reinforced, perhaps it allows pride and arrogance, entitlement to arise. When their identity is not agreed with by others, when they're put down or disrespected, this holding on to a tight and solid identity allows for depression, or anger, humiliation, rage, just like it does for us when our false sense of self, the overly concrete view of self, is used as a shield or a protection when that very thing is what blocks us from connection. and wish them freedom from these false barriers they've created. Wish yourself free from them as well. Try to allow pathways of connection between you. May you be free of suffering. May I be free of suffering. May we be free of suffering. And so think that this one person becomes a representative of anyone who will ever allow you to close the heart. Any time in the past, any time in the present and future where the heart might want to shut down from compassion. 
they represent that. And so think may they and every single sentient being be free of the suffering of suffering, the suffering of forgetting impermanence, the suffering of not knowing identity, grasping to the false one. May they be free of it all. And by thinking in this way, may I have even equanimous compassion, heart open in all directions. and sending out compassionate wisdom in all directions from your heart center radiating out in the form of white light. Fills you white light that radiates out. Compassionate wisdom bringing peace. And you can add the compassion wisdom mantra. Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 Imagine the mantra and light continuously filling you and radiating out from you. And as we shift out of meditation into our rest of our day, pulling that idea with you into it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> See you next time.